two. Microphone check one, two. Your voice is so much baser than mine. <laughs> you should be doing this job. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you know my guests from shows like The Cosby Show and Malcolm and Eddie. Also, all that, Keenan and Kel, a whole mm. bunch of other appearances. Right. Um, but what you may or may not know is this man does some amazing music, and we're going to get into that in just a second. Please welcome Malcolm Jamal Warner. How are hey, you, sir? I'm good. How are you, Eric? I'm, uh, I got to tell you, I'm a little thrown off right now because uh, I grew up with you, man. I, I, I grew up watching you, especially being from uh, New York during the time, sure, and watching yeah, man. everything. Yeah. So I got to relate to a lot of what was going on, the times. Yeah, uh, living in, when you were living in Brooklyn, I was out in Long Island, so a little bit different, but still New York nonetheless. Yeah, no doubt, no um, doubt. And, and then we shot in Long Island City, so you right. know we got a little, clo- little, little closer. Just by name, because yeah. I think that's technically Queens. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> I want to start off with something, and if you just trust me for a second, you'll okay. see where I'm going here watched a whole bunch of other interviews that you've done and I know a lot of places and outlets have uh, focused more on recent events with with Bill. Mm -hmm. I did notice though that a lot of the times they weren't really focusing on your music and it didn't uh, some of these interviews didn't become about that they were focusing on what was going on with Mr. Cosby. I want to start off this interview right now with going right into the music and go with that first and then go into all the other stuff. Cosby Show and all that and all the fun stuff there. There you go. I appreciate I I appreciate the support of buttering me up and getting me to feel comfortable before we talk about Cosby. (laughs) Theo likes me. (laughs) Uh, Let's start off with the, the band here it's uh, miles long yes now from what i understand you're saying it, it, the, the title reflects i guess your journey coming from uh, uh where you grew up in uh, jersey city and acting and all the stuff to where you are now it's re- reflecting the journey that you were on well it's, it's actually re- reflecting specifically my music journey okay um you know i've come a long way musically but i have a long way to go right. kind of kind of deal so I actually started, um, you know, as growing up and as part of the hip hop generation, uh, Miles Long was actually the name of my first rap group. Wow. In like Is 89. that available anywhere or are those tapes Fortunately, buried Fortunately, they're not available anywhere. And, and, and it's what's so funny is back then, you know, I'm like 19, 20 and, you know, our whole concept was, man, you know what? We're so far ahead of all these other, you know, rappers, you know, there's, the distance is miles long because we're just so far ahead and so deep. Uh, that was at 1920. Right. And then when I actually started uh, studying, when I picked up an instrument and started to, and committed to studying the language of music at 26, 27, I kept the name Miles Long, but made that represent my musical journey. You have some great ex-girlfriends because I'm sure they have cassettes of these things and they're not revealing it at, at all. I, we're like, we're not putting Malcolm's music <laughs> out there. Look, my mom and my dad uh, are best friends and they've been separated since I was three years old. Right. So I learned from my dad, keep your exes close. To <laughs> One of these days I'm going to find this because I would just love to hear. I mean, look at uh, Will Smith's early stuff before he was Fresh Prince. Oh, the demos and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he looks back and laughs at it now but uh, you, you can't find it anywhere. Right. But when it was available at one point, everyone's got to start somewhere, you know, and as it, goofy or as uh, corny as it may sound, dated for the time yeah. that they're doing it, yeah. it was serious to them, and that laid a foundation to build other things yeah. and better things yeah. like that. And actually, actually, and when I go back and I think about those those demos as a rapper, it was always, the stuff was still, still very conscious. Um, and so I think that theme has kind of carried on into uh, me as an adult and as a spoken word artist. Uh, you know, there's uh, consciousness to my to my work. There's always um, what I've realized recurring themes about self love, self accountability, self responsibility. So I think I've always been from a place of if you're going to write, you know, m- make it uh, make it be of substance. Right. I think my father instilled that in me. Growing up the way you did and where you did, being on the Cosby Show, there was a lot of uh, uh, musicians that were guest appearing on the show, uh, right. legends. Sure. Uh, of course, Bill's love for uh, for jazz, so you you had all that stuff around there. Sure. Was that an influence for you to go into music, or did you already have that? Yeah, you know, so so just just back up for a second. So when I, when I mentioned my, my father instilling that in me, I meant my real father. No, I know, <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm just saying, um, yeah. you were lucky enough to be exposed being on that show yeah. to some of these uh, legendary musicians did that yeah. influence where you wanted to go or did you already know that like I kind of want to do music it 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 reaffirmed um you know my interest in music and in that my father so my people think my middle name is Jamal my first name is Malcolm Jamal uh, my father There's a hyphen in there people. Yeah, yeah yeah my 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 father named me after Malcolm X and Ahmad Jamal 
the, the, the renowned drummer, right? jazz pianist. Oh, piano. Yeah. Piano, sorry. Um, because my father wanted me to be a jazz musician. When I was a baby, he would put me in my sitter and sit me right in front of the speaker and play soft jazz because he wanted me to have an appreciation for music. My mother, my mother thought that was so stupid, but <laughs> you know, my dad had a plan. So when I finally picked up an instrument at 26, uh, my dad was elated. It's like finally, it's taken him 26 years, but now he's gonna he's gonna play music. It's like why couldn't you do that as a teenager? You could have picked Tito Puente's brain and got some tips, <laughs> right, you know? Right, right, and and. It's funny because starting um, my musicianship at such a late age, uh, I have those same thoughts like, why didn't I start this 20 years ago? I could have been so much further ahead. But you got there. That's yeah, the important yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. But it, it's it's a constant challenge, man, because I tell people all the time, it takes so much time, energy, focus, and discipline right. just to be an okay musician. So cats were phenomenal. I really respect their level of, of musicianship because I, I get what goes into that. Uh, I got a chance to check out um, uh, your first two albums. And the third one, let's plug that right now so we can get that. Uh, Selfless, it came out on September 18th. Is it hard copy? Because I saw it online as far as iTunes and Amazon. And stuff yeah, it's like iTunes, that. Yeah, iTunes uh, or my website, MalcolmJamalWarner.com. Can you buy the actual CD? Is it all um, digital? There, it, it's, it's mostly digital. Okay. I actually, I, um, I ended up printing up some physical copies because I was here in New York at the Circle of Sisters event at the uh, Jacob Javison this weekend. So okay. I did had a couple of booths and I brought CDs there so I can actually sell and sign. The uh, the music itself, I, I can see a lot of influence from different spots sure. with what you what you guys are doing. There's some funk, some soul. You got the spoken word kind of vibe yeah, with it. Yeah. I'm sensing a little. Was George Clinton Parliament was that an influence on you at all? Well, I mean, yeah, it, it's hard to to, to be into um, you know funk and R and B and right. not be influenced. Because I, I sense so, I, I noticed it actually more on the slower stuff. Sure. Than you do on the faster yeah, stuff. Yeah, a lot of people associate the Clinton Parliament Funkadelic stuff with the faster, you know, bop gun, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But on the slower stuff, what you were doing, getting the groove, the vibe kind of thing, I noticed a lot of ties to that. Yeah, yeah, very, very perceptive. Also, I want to point out your first album, which I have a little bit of beef with you. Uh, um, the cover, or actually, maybe it's not the first album, it's, it's the mixtape yes, cover, okay? Yes. I really aggravated with your photo where <laughs> you're leaning back and, and I'll paint the picture for everybody you have a white shirt on and you're just kind of leaning back like you know like a oh well shrug you know but you're laughing your shirt's busted open you've got an amazing build on you and you're laughing like oh my shirt popped off again this happens all the time and they caught you in mid laugh like oh this is right, so silly right right and I'm like right. oh I hate his abs I really hate his abs I wish I could look like that well you know what I wish I could look like that too <laughs> that was probably like that was 15 years ago so i'm i'm still struggling to, to to get back to that well i'll say this at least you had that to look back right. in your life you can say at one point dad looked like this i've got I pictures don't have to that, show it right you know but well uh, I, I need something to offset the awkward teenage uh images that i cannot i can't get rid of those your dad was theo but here's when he was lenny kravitz look at him right here <laughs> Uh, so tell right. me about the tell me about the third album, Selfless. Here, yeah, man, uh, I'm I'm really excited about this this record because I've got some great uh, collaborations on it. Uh, Stokely Williams from In Condition, Layla Hathaway, Robert Glasper, Rasan Patterson, and Lettucey. So I've got some really cool people who have uh, you know come on to collaborate with me. Um, this record really represents where I am now at 45 uh, <laughs> years old. Uh, just in terms of you know just where I am in love um, and just where I am in uh, just, just just where I am in in, in terms of at a, being at a point in life where I'm finally comfortable enough in my own skin not to be ruled by other opinions of me and what people think of me. Okay, which is you know it, that's an odd place for an artist to be because you want to be in a place where you don't care what people think about you, but the success of your art greatly depends on what people think about you. And eventually dictates your personality, your writing style. You, you try not, yeah, you, it, it, it influences. Yeah, I'd say influence rather than dictate because at some point you have to, you know, be clear for yourself and make a stand for yourself what you're going to stand for and what your boundaries are. And sometimes, you know, there may be some public opinion that may not gel with that, but at the end of the day, you have to, uh, you have to go with, you know, what your soul tells you. 
being a 40 uh, at this point mm. of your life, um, how does it feel going out on the road and touring as opposed to doing it at a younger age? Great, because I think I'm a better musician. Right. Um, and How's the wear and tear on you, though? Well, you know, I don't do, you know, I, I, I don't have a uh, I don't have a tour a tour budget like tour support so it's not like I'm on the road for weeks at a time. Right. A lot of my uh, gigging, uh, you know, they're they're one offs, especially if I'm going out of town. They're generally one offs. Um, it's still my dream to like go on a six week tour, just being able to play every night. Like I think that would what that would do for my musicianship. I think would be incredible. Plus, you have a bus to sleep on. Yeah, which but, is makes it a lot better when you're traveling. But it's got to be a really comfortable bus, <laughs> right. you know. And the no crunch rule. What's that? It means every band always has that rule with on the bus that you're not allowed to go to the bathroom. No crunch rule. I love it. On that, yeah. on that, yes, you have to wait exactly. till we get to the gas station. There you go. Yeah, I'm all about that. Is there no official website? I found a Facebook for the mm. for the band. It's I mean, Miles Long Music on Facebook. On Facebook right. Is there an official like dot com or anything for that? It would be uh, it would be MalcolmJamalWarner.com. off your site. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because 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 so so what Miles Long is you know I kind of got the concept from KRS One. And Boogie Down Productions. Nice. You know, so it's really KRS One and his crew, you know, or um, Arrested Development. It's really speech and, you know, crew of cast that he put together. So Miles Long is really, um, you know, a a collection of, of artists, um, you know, other musicians, <coughs> other poets, um, other writers. So I use Miles Long because I do have a crew of people, but when it really comes down to, to a lot of the writing and, and, and the, the songs themselves, it's just generally me and a couple of cats I write with. All right. Uh, go to Miles Long Music on Facebook, but of course it's on iTunes and MalcolmJamalWarner.com. Yes. You can buy all that stuff. Now, can we go to some of the fun stuff? I, I thought that was That the is the fun, fun, stuff. fun stuff. That is. <laughs> That is the fun stuff, but my own personal fun okay, stuff. Gotcha. Right? This is where I'm going to fanboy just a little bit mm. on you. Of course, everybody talks to you about the Cosby show. I don't know. Are you sick of it at this point? Do you embrace what it is? Or did you have a problem at one point trying to separate yourself from that? No, I've never had a problem with it. I think so. There's this misconception about how I feel about Theo, I guess, because, you know, people love to call me Theo and I'm very quick to correct anyone and say, no, my name is Malcolm right? <laughs> uh, because I don't consider myself Theo even at the height of the show when you know, I, was, I would sign autographs and people would say, well, sign, put Theo. And I'm like, no, I'm not Theo. Right. Because I even knew then that Theo was not going to be the end-all, be-all of my career. Yeah, you don't want to be typecast. Yeah, and I, and I also knew that the I was very aware as a teenager that the transition from being seen as child actor to being taken taken seriously as adult actor might not be a smooth one. Right. So I was always I was pretty much obsessed with life after Cosby and what I was going to do after Cosby because I never wanted to be one of those where are they now kids. That's smart. You know? Some yeah. kids are living in the in the moment and they're not thinking ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And even, you know, at the height of the show, when people would ask, Well, you know, what's it feel like to be successful? Right. And even even at 15, 16 years old, my philosophy was, well, this show is successful, but because being on a number one show does not guarantee an acting career for the rest of my life, right. it won't be until I'm 40, 50, 60 years old, uh, having been working consistently as an actor and director, that I can look back and say, I've had a successful career. What do you think when, to this day, when you have people like myself that mm. come up and say, I grew up on the show, uh, that show was my childhood or my young adult life, yeah. and it doesn't matter what the race is, even though you know it's an all-black family, you get every race saying, I watched the Cosby show, yeah. I grew up, this was my family. Yeah, it's awesome. And I think it's really a testament to, uh, you know, to Mr. Cosby, because a lot of the shows came from his monologues. Right. Um, so, you know, by the time the show came on, he already and I, had before a the show started. I, my dad had all the albums. Yeah, exactly. So I would exactly. listen to the records, you know, and hearing like Buck Buck and uh, story, Weird Harold and, and yeah. stuff that uh, was from his neighborhood. And you could see some of those stories translate into the Cosby show. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So he had that universal appeal. Um, you know, to start with. So, you know, I think that's one of the things that, that made the show so transcending is that he the stories he was telling were universal stories. And oftentimes, especially in uh, in 
black sitcoms, the humor is so tied into uh, what's considered the black experience. Right. Um, the humor is predicated on being black, whereas this show was about, you know, a family who were very clearly black, but the humor and the issues were universal issues. Or about the family. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, you know, got a lot of backlash from people because of that. I mean, there were times... Um, I'm sure you get everybody's favorite moments from the show, and yeah. then sometimes are you know a lot of the, the the same, and sometimes it's like that moment stuck with you for the rest of your life. I don't get that, like Bill with the sandwiches around the house. Mm-hmm. When he was trying to eat his the sandwich just in peace, or he was trying to keep it away from Claire. I do that now, you know, you and See? I was like, oh my god, I got that's exactly why I love sandwiches because he would just sit there at the table watching TV eating this huge sandwich. The hoagies, yeah. <laughs> Another thing. I learned how to open a jar of pickles from the show. I don't remember that the, one. There was an episode where everyone's trying to open it, and I yeah. think it was uh, the older sister, Sandra. Yeah. Right? Came in there, she just looked at it. She, You smack the bottom of the jar to release the suction and open it up when oh, everyone else funny. couldn't open that's it. Great. I learned that off the Cosby that's, show. And, and it worked. It, it's still to it this day. Now. It always worked. Uh, but it's just these little moments that you're like, I can't believe that TV show, even though I, I enjoyed it, I watched it every... Actually, I watched it on Fridays because my uh, I was still in school and stuff for uh, earlier seasons. Yeah. My parents would tape it on yes. the VCR. Yeah. So I would watch the tape the next day when I came home and, and watch... Uh, what was the start of must-see TV on uh, Thursday nights yeah, with NBC. There you go. There you go. Uh, but yeah, all these little moments, like you can see where I'm rattling off all this <laughs> stuff here. It's like, oh my God, this, this, and this. I mean, uh, even uh, the neighbor, oh, I've got to look up his name right Peter. here, Wallace Shawn. Oh, well, yeah. Wallace oh, Shawn, yeah, who played yeah. you know one of Cliff's best friends, yeah, the neighbor man. and everything. And then I, I saw him there and then realized he was on The Princess Bride. Oh my God. You know, so yeah. I had the reverse effect yeah. on it. So, yeah. I mean, that show yeah. just meant so much to me. I had that too, because when I saw Princess Bride, I was like, oh, that's Wallace Shawn. And he was, I love him in them. That, that's one of my favorite movies, actually. Me Still. too. Yeah. I mean, that, that's yeah. good to hear because yes. anything else would be inconceivable. Um, <laughs> uh, the other thing, too, with the show was I always look forward to the beginning of the fall season because the intro would change. Mm-hmm. And you never knew what version you were going to get as far as the, the interpretation of the theme song. Yeah. And then it became classy then ridiculous then so yes. dramatic over the top yes. where you, <clears throat> you did like the musical for the intro and like each season like oh that's the new intro you're excited not just to see the show and everybody coming back but what is this intro uh, season's intro yeah, gonna be yeah yeah i think my favorite one is the one where uh it's more of a smooth jazz vibe and you're wearing a tuxedo yep i think that's the bobby mcferrin it's bobby mcferrin doing that uh yeah, I think yeah, that's, that's that might yeah, be the one. Yeah. And you, you're, they cut to you, and you just have nothing. You just like you want no part of it. And then all of a sudden, your foot Moving slips down and just doing yeah. a little thing. I don't know why that made me laugh as a kid, <laughs> but that just did, and that always stuck with me there. That's great because I hate it. I'm so glad you weren't going to say the one with the Caribbean and all that. Honestly, I hated that, that was my least favorite. Yeah, I hated it. We, we, well, well, maybe I was the only one who hated doing it, but I didn't like that one. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like South Pacific. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> Everyone coming out and you're doing this huge musical store. Yes, and the director kept saying, okay, come on people, <laughs> we're going to make it hot and tasty. Um, everyone has their favorite episode, one of mine being the, the Stevie Wonder episode. Mm, you jamming on, jamming the on the one. Yeah. And the episode where you heard stories from Bill, and then you applied it to when you were living in your college apartment, and you had the soda machine coming from the fridge, yes, yes. and ruined the apartment and yes. sliding on the soap and all that yes. stuff. What were some of yours? I, I I have several. I would probably say my all time favorite would have been the the very first one when Theo was giving D's in school. And there was the whole uh, back and forth with Theo and Cliff with the Monopoly bunny. Right. And then Theo gives this really heartfelt speech about wanting to be regular people. And if, you know, if you want to, <laughs> if you want a doctor, if mom wasn't a lawyer, I'd still love you. Why can't you just love me for me? And it was such a, it was, it was such a heartfelt speech that he finishes the speech and the audience is like clapping and they're with him. Like you and, got him. Bill's, yeah. Bill's flabbergasted. Yeah. And he just looks and he says, Theo. That's the dumbest, dumbest thing, thing I've yes. ever heard about. That's probably my favorite episode. I love that. But... I'll eat bologna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll eat bologna and cereal. And that, and that one little bit out of that entire run, that is the go-to bit whenever they do retrospectives on the Emmys or NBC yeah. or, or you know the greatest TV shows of all time. It always cuts. <clears throat> excuse me. It always cuts down to that scene of in your bedroom. With you and your dad with the Monopoly money. Yeah, it was that's or classic. the one where you had the uh, earring and you're just kind of mimicking back and forth so he can't get a look at it. Yeah, that's actually one of my favorites. I remember a few years ago, probably maybe about four or five years ago now, uh, I watched that earring episode 
and I was in my living room on my couch by myself. And now, see, I'm finally far removed enough from the show where I could watch it as a viewer because for so long, I still watched it, you know, with the critical eye and looking at my work and seeing what I could have done differently, what I could have done better. Um, so I'd finally gotten to a point where I could, I was far removed enough from the show where I can actually watch it as a viewer right. and get what people, you know, saw. So I watched that particular uh, earring episode on the bed and they're going back and forth. And I sat there by myself and laughed on my couch by myself. Right. And I called Mr. Cosby up. I said, Hey man, I'm watching the show. Man, we were funny. And he said, <laughs> you're damn right. We were funny. And he hung up the phone <laughs> angrily at you. I'm running out of time with you, but uh, all that, Keenan and Kel, your guest appearances on there, uh, was a bit after the Cosby show mm. and before Malcolm and Eddie, and all of a sudden, there he is, he's back, he's doing something. Yeah. You know, it was really exciting to see you, so I loved that. I loved you on Keen Peel. Um, oh, yeah, those were great. Yeah, those ago, guys were great. We were playing a Republican, was really good. Those uh, guys but great. you also, in February, as uh, FX American Crime Story. You're doing the people, the people versus, versus OJ, OJ Simpson. Simpson yeah. and you're playing Al Cowling yeah, yes. against uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., who's OJ. Right? Right. Yes, yes. So uh, look out for that, yes. too. I, I'm, I'm playing the guy who's most famously known as the driver of the white Bronco. Did you get to drive the right Bronco? Yes. Or oh, they yeah. cut to the actual footage? No, we shut down the 710 freeway in California to, to shoot that scene. Horrible incident, but how awesome was it to do that? <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and I did, I did all the driving myself. All right. I, unfortunately, I ran out of time with you, no sir. Worries. Otherwise, Thank you, I, could, I could talk to you forever. And Thanks I'm for the sure great conversation, man. Uh, Malcolm Jamal War on Twitter. Yes, uh, it's sir. also Instagram. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Miles Long Music on Facebook. Get the album Selfless. It's out now. Get it on iTunes or MalcolmJamalWarner.com. Yeah. Man. Sir, next time you're uh, back in New York here, I'd love to have you come up and talk to you again. Cool. Just I would love to. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and if, for, the re- if for, for whatever reason, something happens and they're casting auditions for uh, the Eric Nagel show. Right. Uh, I'll have the producers let me know because I would love to come audition. Please, and yeah. then we can get the, the kid who played Peter on the Cosby Show there to play me. There we go. Thank you so much, hey, sir. Thank you, brother. Take care. All right. <laughs> oh, that was fun, man.